amateur archaeologist of Jackson Hole board oh member. And yes, this will be the uh, my first lunchtime talk, but I've done three others. And uh, so this talk is about the greatest show on earth. And uh, when I say greatest show on earth, I don't mean a circus. I mean the Tucson Rock and Barrel Show. Uh, number two in the world is probably Munich which is held in the fall. Number three is Shanghai. This talk is always held the end of January, first two weeks of February, roughly, depending on the calendar. The second largest in the United States is in Denver, but there's shows all throughout the country. But this is, this is the sort of the mother of all shows. And, and this is not one show. This is actually this is a map of Tucson, here's I-10. All these little circles are different locations and venues. So there's actually 44 of them. And I think we'll be done by midnight. We're going to go through all of them. No. I've selected sort of five that I go to regularly. And I've been going to Tucson for about five years now. Uh, this is actually a list of all the shows. And so each show is often could be as many as two or three hundred different vendors. And so you can see that there's there's an awful lot of awful lot of people there. Oh a lot of marks. Yes, so we're gonna focus on five. twenty uh, second street, the Tucson City Center, and then these two I'm gonna sort of jumble together because you kind of walk from one into the other and they're hotels. And then the Mineral and Fossil Co-op, which is very small, but has some very, very cool stuff. Uh, some of the shows require a resale license to enter. Some don't care, but they won't sell to you unless you have one. Most, though, don't really. Most of the shows are fine to anybody walking in. It's not just minerals and fossils. There's a lot of jewelry. People come from all over the world to go to this show. You will hear languages from every continent but Antarctica. So you will hear French, Italian, German, Bulgarian, Polish, uh, Urdu, people from Pakistan and Afghanistan, Portuguese, Spanish, Russian, the list goes on and on, some African languages as well. It's truly a very, very international show. And, and there are thousands of people that are coming to sell or to buy. Uh, there's things in every price range, from a million dollars to five dollars. And there are, sh there are shuttle service. A car is really, really helpful, though. And no matter how many times you go, you will always see things you know. <coughs> so what's the appeal? Why, why even do this? And this is kind of a subjective thing. But for me, I, I just find minerals and fossils fascinating. Fossils are, are kind of this window into an ancient world of it's, sometimes things that don't exist anymore and haven't existed for, well, in the case of this guy, 65 million years. Uh, in the case of this guy, 251 million. Minerals have their own special sort of appeal, form, color. They're all unique. They're all different. You know, figuring out their valuations is, is a very subjective issue. In a way, it's like art. I mean, why is a Van Gogh worth $120 million? I don't know. Uh, and since I don't have the kind of money to buy art, I, I buy rocks and minerals, I guess. <laughs> So the appeal is you know, very subjective. What you're going to see following is kind of what I find appealing. Keep in mind, you are seeing one one thousandth of a percent of what's there, maybe even another couple of decimal points over. Uh, so the first show we're going to visit is 22nd Street. This is the tent. It starts here. It goes two and a half football fields this way, north to south. Uh, that's the interstate I-10. And they, they talk about it as sort of like this is how many hotel rooms, because 
many of the venues are actually hotels that are taken over by the show. And so people come, they sleep in the room at night sometimes, and then they make the bed, they put all their stuff out on the bed, and people come in and buy stuff, they hope. Uh, this, obviously no one's sleeping in, and so it's a bit more of an open venue, and, and so, so because in a hotel room, and none of the hotel rooms are this big, they're all a fraction of this, five people walk into the hotel room and you're, you're bumping elbows. Uh, in 2016, they had over 40,000 people in the 18 days they were open. The weekends are, are especially hectic. There's kind of everything. Uh, this gentleman, Rich, specializes in uh, mammoth tusks, and, but he also has, has tons and tons of minerals. Uh, a lot of Peruvian pyrite. and. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with pyrite, I brought a <clears throat> small specimen. This is actually Spanish pyrite, but it's the same mineral. It's also called fool's gold, iron sulfide. And the, uh, the pyrite from this particular mine is world-renowned because it sort of forms these almost perfect cubes. They're very shiny. These have not been treated. This is, this is how they find them. Uh, this actually is... Uh, Cretaceous age, that's about 70 or 80 million years old, they can actually figure out when the pyrite is <coughs> And uh, I just ask you to be careful with it because it is like 70 million years old. So uh, I'm happy to pass it around and you know, take a look at it. If that, or would you prefer I don't? You, you want it back? He's <laughs> <laughs> well, got a long inventory. Okay, well, I, 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 I got three pockets. <laughs> I, I should also add that, you know, in my mind, this show is sort of like the Smithsonian meets the Mideast Bazaar. And almost everything is for sale. Not everything, but many things. And prices are usually negotiable. Uh, and they never sell everything. So if you see something that you got to have, well, I know a lot of these people will call them up and see if it's still around. These are mammoth teeth, and uh, since I happen to have a, a couple of mammoth teeth lying around, I figured I would bring bring one in. And, and, and this is so. This one is a little different than these. This is actually sawed in half and then polished, so you can actually see the internal structure of the teeth. And mammoth, we have two teeth. We got our baby teeth, our adult teeth, and then we're done. And mammoths have to get four sets of teeth throughout their lives as they get bigger. Once these grooves wear out, that's what they grind up the vegetation with. Once those are flattened and they are on their fourth tooth, they die because they can't eat anymore. So here, uh, again, this is, uh, this is actually Russian mammoth. So these, these animals have been extinct for about 5,000 years. Mostly they went extinct a little earlier, a few hung on on, uh, <clears throat> on a few islands. So I'll pass one around one side and one around the other. This is a uh, ammonite. Ammonites are extinct cephalopods, so they're re related to squid. And I had never seen the Texan ones before. What's interesting about these is the animal actually lived from here, probably about here. Part of the shell's broken off, I'm sure. And so there was this squid-like animal in there with tentacles, and it would use these chambers, which are called septa, to add air or water so that it could go up and down and change the buoyancy in the water column. And this side buckle, this tube right here actually is what they use to introduce gas or liquid into these chambers and then go up or down depending on what they wanted to do. And uh, this is actually a Madagascar ammonite, and I'll pass it around. And, and with the hand lens, if you put the hand lens right kind of <coughs> there, you can see the siphuncle perfectly. And, uh, this is a 90 million year old shell 
from a squid-like animal. These went extinct uh, with the dinosaurs at, at Cretaceous time. So again, please be careful with it. And in the center, the septa got filled with calcite. So this actually has all these little calcite crystals in there. So don't touch the crystals. Just hold it on the outside and uh, take a look if you want. And, and you don't need to use the hand lens. For those of you who don't know how to use one of these, you want it right up to your eye and you want it right up to here. So it's really, I mean, there's no room between your eye and it and very little between this and the fossil. And, and so that's unusual to find them preserved with both living chamber and all the other parts. These don't have any living chamber on them. This is a really unusual animal. Uh, this is a Dimetrodon, so it's 290 million years old. It was found in Texas. And the thing about fossils, and even minerals, is if people didn't get involved and clean, assemble, repair, these things would look like nothing. And so this fossil is actually only 40%, less than half original animal, and then Another 50%, they took bones from other animals, and then 10%, they just cast it parts. But that's actually really, really complete for an animal like this. And so it had this huge sale, which we don't actually know what that was about or for. People have said thermal regulation, mating displays. We don't know. Uh, this is completely a museum piece. It's about this big. It's a synapsid. <coughs> Because it has two holes in the back of its skull here, that, that's how you that's why you would classify it that way. And so the synapses are actually proto-mammals. So these are more closely related to us than dinosaurs. It does, doesn't look like it, but that's what the uh, that's what an evolutionary biologist would tell you. And and these grew pretty big. Uh, this is the species they had there. And again, these sales, really unusual. We, we don't quite know what they're about. Uh, this is another Permian lizard. This one, because it was found in a concretion about this big, and they split the concretion open, is very, very well preserved. And so they didn't have to uh, fabricate bones to glue in there. It's pretty much. It's unusual to find that, and you don't get it with really big animals because obviously the concretion has to get it. How do they know where to split it without destroying it? Well, they try and split it in the middle, and often they will cleave along that plane. Now, sometimes someone will be on one side and someone will be on the other. Sometimes they'll, they'll do that, you know, depending on the value of the specimen, and then they'll actually glue it back together and then prep it from the outside. You know, once they found out there's something good in there. What sort of price range would they? Uh, I do know prices on most of these things. <laughs> this guy had about three or four of these, and I want to say ballpark ten thousand dollars, twelve thousand dollars. <coughs> I could be off a thousand or so either way, but in that range. Asking price. Asking price. Asking price. Asking price. I'm sorry. Asking price or. Uh, no, that was sort of, I know these guys really well. I bought a lot of stuff from them. That was sort of like, this is what we sell to you for, Mike. Uh, and, and, and with negotiating, some people will drop their price in half, some people will not change their price at all. And everybody's an individual that way there. There's no, uh, it's not totally like that. Mike, what was the scale on that one? Was it, was it really tiny or was it about this big? This big. This big. So, about, so that conclusion had been... <laughs> A boulder that, that they right. had. Right, yes, about a meter across. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, this is Barbara about to get chopped by a Moroccan mosasaur. Uh, <laughs> this thing is 30 feet long. Uh, I'm pretty sure I can get this for you for $120,000. I didn't try negotiating, so I bet I can do a little better uh, if you have 30 feet in your house to put this in. Or you, or you spend a million dollars to build a garage to put it in. <laughs> well, uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> then, 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 then this lizard will seem cheap. Yeah. So these were the apex predators, the Cretaceous Seaway. The most, 
we actually find an awful lot of these skeletons in Kansas, but uh, we do also get them in Morocco and the uh, phosphate mines. They're related to monitor lizards, and these are animals that were living on the land and then returned to the ocean. Uh, the largest mosasaurus can get up to be 50, 60 feet, just enormous things. And the way they bite, they actually have these teeth here, and then on the inside, you can't see them, there's another set of teeth, so they grab you with that, and those little teeth hold you, and then the jaw is a hinge that allows it to open really wide, take another bite, get you all the way in, and then you're done for it. Oh, exciting. Yeah. Yeah, bad, bad. And, and these things hate other mosasaurs, ammonites, anything they could catch. So they have two jaws? No, they have, no, they have well, a lower and upper, but they have two sets of teeth. Yeah, but so how is that little bit of, bit of teeth holding you there while the other one chomps again? The, the, these are curved <laughs> this way, and so they are meant to sort of ratchet you back into, your, into the animal's throat. And so while it opens, those other teeth are a little finer, and they keep you from trying to s swim back out. It's like a fish. It, it, it's, it's like the spikes in the car rental place where you exactly. don't Exactly. <laughs> 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 <That's fair. laughs> right. don't, don't back up. <laughs> uh, also, in the same area, there's a, a triceratops here being chomped by a T-Rex. This is out of Montana. Uh, a very bad day. This is the side view. Yeah, that's this is the the and, and you can see in the background, this guy's from Madagascar. He's got 100 ammonites for sale. I mean, there are more fossils at this show than you can believe ever existed in the world. Was it found like that? Or is that like a manufactured pre presentation? I'm not totally sure. I think <laughs> that uh, some of this is cast, but I think that they felt like it was predated upon. Huh. And but I'm not sure it was actually found that way, because the guy wasn't there to talk to about it. The Mosasaur actually called him up and asked him what the price was and you know, some other information. That's how I knew it was wrong. Uh, this is a cast, and this is a small T-Rex. Uh, and, and most museums want casts, because if they're bones, they're really heavy, and you have to have this big support structure, which makes it very cumbersome. So this is the, uh, we, and, and the other thing about this show is, you see mostly fossils, but that's just because of my sort of tunnel vision. Uh, but in reality, you know, you'll be, you'll have fossils right here, and then right here you'll have minerals. And the whole thing, and so the show, my slideshow is all jumbled together, because that's what the show is actually like. It's not like you go to one place and, oh, Cretaceous fossils here, no. It's all mixed together, so next to this, is a guy selling fluorite. Next to him is a guy selling amethyst, and, and so on and so forth. This comes out of Cameron, Wyoming, and uh, this was Adam Lindgren's booth. And a lot of these are sort of family affairs. So you go chat with Adam, and then you walk about 30 feet, and there's his brother. He has another booth with a whole set of fossils. And then you go to another location, and there's his dad. And then you chat with, with his dad. And so you get to know the whole thing. Uh, this gar is probably five feet long or so. It, it, it's, it's really big. Original slab, very little reconstruction. Uh, there's a close up of the head. You can actually see the teeth in it. The scales are, are simply amazing. I mean, the prep work on this thing is just, does, doesn't get much better. And like I said, you walk over. 10 feet, the next booth, and there's somebody selling fluorite and calcite from Tennessee and Illinois. This is a large calcite. This calcite is probably about the size of my fist. Right? Just briefly on the previous one, since they're from Camera, did they get some of that out of the fossil butte area there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. fossil lake. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, all these, all, and we'll see more stuff from there, but it all comes out of fossil lake. Not from the National Monument, of course, but from private yeah. land that people own or lease. Yeah, yeah. Not, not from the other land. Yeah, so this is a, a beautiful cubic fluorite, a lovely calcite. This is a little, this is actually my pen, so this is for scale. This is a very small piece, more like a thumbnail piece, but it's got all the minerals in one. 
So it's got perfect calcite along the fluorite. This is agatized coral. It's about 20 million years old. And I brought, I brought a couple pieces just so you can see what this stuff looks like. And so I actually had the other half of this, which would have been a little small coral head. This too, the next slide, is the other piece of this. So it was a coral head this big. They sawed it in half. They polished these edges. The inside has been infiltrated with silica-rich water, which forms this beautiful sort of druzy-looking agate. And there's two completely different pieces of it. This way you put it up, you can almost see light through it. And again, these are very delicate and fragile. They're 20 million years old. So please be careful as you pass them around. And I, I feel pretty good, it's not a huge group. There's no one here under, well, my teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and only one of those. Right. You, you Here's the other half. You can't half. buy books for a semester. <laughs> <laughs> so this would be the other half. And you can see it's got these just gorgeous pockets of these druzy crystals. And, uh, and I have one of these about this big. I couldn't bring it today. What does druzy mean? Druzy is this sort of coating of small crystals that coat a surface. And they're usually very sparkly. They're, that's a scientific definition. John, is that? Yes, usually, yes. Very tiny coating of crystals. Right, that coats a surface. And you'll see it as this comes around. Usually quartz. Yes. Uh, so then you go a couple more feet. And here's a Ramphorhynchus, which is paradactyl. This is a small guy, about this big. This is from the world famous Solpothen formation. And the, so they found these bones. They were all disarticulated and messed up. They probably weren't even all there. They took a slab of rock from nearby. They routered out. And you can actually see, I mean, this is just so smooth. It was done with a machine. It was routered. <clears throat> and then they reconstructed this bone bones piece by piece by piece and glued them back into the matrix. And, uh, and you know, if you were interested in buying it, you would say, okay, show me the parts that are real, show me the parts that you had to cast, you know, and then you mark it up price. We're going to leave that venue. Having only seen like, you know, 10 minutes of what could take you all day. And we're going to go to Tucson City Center. This is Barb standing in front of the lobby. Here's a small uh, amethyst geode <laughs> with a calcite crystal. And uh, before we go in, though, did he we, bring that home for you? Yeah, I brought two of them. <laughs> Just wait. <laughs> Just, that's the small one. It was, and it's I mean, rock I, I know it, it may not seem like it. So before you go in, though, you get distracted because here's this guy selling the finest petrified wood in the world. Uh, which is Arizona, my opinion, of course, all the Triassic, so 230 million year old. Uh, and it's just, it's got reds, it's got yellows, it's got every sort of color imaginable in there, which come from trace minerals. Uh, I'm going to pass around a couple of pieces of petrified wood, if I can find them. This is kind of heavy. This is actually a piece of palm wood from Louisiana. And again, the idea is. You know, when you look at this stuff, if it weren't cut, if it weren't polished, it would be pretty ugly. But because it is cut and polished, this is beautiful. Look at the other side that it wasn't, and you get a sense of, of that. And then I think I have another piece. Yeah, this is some lovely Eden Valley, Wyoming petrified wood. <clears throat> and those people who know petrified wood would just look at this, and they tell you right off the bat, Eden Valley, because of this little blue opalescence in there. So now we'll go into the lobby. And the first thing you see is, again, Green River, Kemmerer. There's an awful lot of stuff from there. This is a crocodile, uh, a big beast. This is when crocodiles and palm trees grew in Wyoming in, in these intermountain basins. Uh, also in this are gastroliths. And some animals used gastroliths for buoyancy control. Some used them to help digest the food. The crocodiles used them for, for buoyancy control. 
So it just helps them maintain the position they wanted to be in, in the war. But, but that's the degree of preparation here. Uh, this, okay, so the, this turtle, about this big, the reason this is so expensive is this is the seventh one ever found in the world. So these are actually rarer than T. rexes, the species. Rarer than Archaeopteryx, the transition bird reptile fossil. Uh, I did negotiate it down to about half of that for somebody who will, who will make nameless. But he didn't buy it, so it's still there for sale. You go into their ballrooms, and, and I've been looking at this piece for years, right? Love one, yeah, so it's still there. But this is a Triassic fish mortality plate from Austria. Very, very unusual. And it, it's big and it's thick, so it weighs quite a bit, actually. How much is that piece? Uh, the price tag on it, I think, was $13,000. That's why I didn't buy it. Right, exactly. <laughs> Stick with that. I didn't even try to negotiate. I, you know, I'm just, whatever. Oh, your, your so, door money. Right. You, you, you walk somewhere else in the ballroom, and here's John, and he is selling amylite, which is that same from those amethyst, the, yeah, I'm sorry, ammonites that we passed around, the cephalopods. Only due to the preservation of these animals, it has this beautiful iridescence. And this is made into jewelry. So the pieces that are fractured, that they just find lying loose, they turn into jewelry. And so I'll pass this around as well. So you can get a sense of what this looks like. But it's, they are absolutely the most beautiful fossils in the world. In general, many fossils are kind of gray or brown. Well, these are every color in the rainbow. Uh, is that opal? Yeah. I'm sorry? Is that opal? No, it's not. It's uh, they, they, they call it amylite, which is a completely made up name. Uh, but it just, it somehow, in the very, in, in this one location in Alberta, the preservation produced these layers that refract the light like this. Somehow the nacre was replaced, and you don't see this anywhere else in the world. They, I mean, a few companies basically have a lock on this stuff. And so they charge an awful lot for it. Uh, again, I, you know, I've only managed to buy two little pieces this big. My wife has one of them. <laughs> Is it primarily SiO2 or was it coloring? I'm not sure. I, I would guess that there's a lot of, you know, there's some trace minerals in there. It has to do well, with oh, how the with light, trace, yeah. Right, it has to do with how the light is refracting. Right. Chemical Opal. formula, CaCO3, it's calcium uh -huh. carbonate. Right, limestone. Opal-like organic gemstone. Okay. Right, but, but opals have lots of water in them, and they're silica-based. Yeah. So it's not an opal, though. Yeah. What's it, the price tag on this one? The price tag on this one is uh, 50000 marked down to 33000 well, That was a sale. Business. It's a big one. but it's, it's, it's like this big. It, it, well, OK, it's not this big. It's this big. And, and by the way, Ammonites actually grew this big. I mean, the biggest ones on record are something like six feet plus. Here's some of the jewelry, but of course, you can actually see it yourself. And, and it is absolutely, they do make spectacular jewelry. And for a gemstone, I mean, compared to, you know, tanzanite or sapphires or rubies, it's really cheap. Because of the gemstones, it's, it's very reasonable. It's just the big pieces. They take a lot of work as they're assembled. Uh, then we walk over and there's somebody selling Megalodon teeth. So this is a Megalodon tooth, and we're going to talk more about this later, but you can pass this around. Feel the edges, feel the serrations. This is a real tooth from a real shark that lived uh, off the coast of South Carolina, and uh, it was found scuba diving. We'll, we'll, there's, I have a whole picture of big megalodon mouth, and then we'll actually talk about the whole species. Megalodon carcaridon. Exactly. That's the one. The size of a Greyhound bus. Uh, so uh, these are trilobites. And so the gentleman who found this and prepped it, uh, who may yet get him here to speak, 
Uh, they found these on a beach in Quebec. And so trilobites, and I'm going to, this one I, I'm not going to pass around, but trilobites are named for these three lobes, one, two, three. And then in addition, they have this, the tail, pygidium, the thorax, and the cephalon, the head area. And you're going to see a few more of these. I will pass this trilobite around, which we use in our school, I use in our school classes. And you can see the lobes. This is the positive. This is the negative that fits right on top of it. So you kind of got a two for this one. This is Moroccan, actually. This is from Quebec. This is a fabulous piece. Each one of those is bigger than your fist. Uh, he also sells these gogias, which are, these are half a billion years old. They're out of Utah. This plate actually had a little tribal light on it, too. None of these are placed here. These are all how they were found and then cracked. And these are actually very early echinoderms. So they're, they're not related to, uh, they're, they're sort of sister groups to cry on. This is something I'd never seen before, these uh, chlorocystites. Uh, just a very, very strange organism. They didn't have a long run of it. Uh, they were, these, these come from Canada. He had another plate with about 100 of them on it. And uh, so again, I've been to this show five times. I've never seen something like this. No, I've never even seen this a lot. What do you mean it didn't have a very long run of it? Oh, uh, so trilobites last for 250 million years. These, because they're fairly rare in the fossil record, didn't, you know, they weren't around for 50 million years. I don't know how long they were around for, or, or maybe they had a very limited distribution, but they're not common in the fossil record. That's what I meant. And, and, and so you don't see them, whereas other echinoderms like starfish, you see them going back 150, 200 million years. Crinoids, you see, from almost 480 million years ago. So today, so. Uh, this is a trilobite, which is unlike anything I've ever seen or been in Chile. And so this is about this big. The eyes on this gave this animal 360 degree vision. So it could sit in the mud with these little things sticking up, and it could look in all directions, looking out for predators, we're looking out for feeding opportunities. The other really unusual thing about this is this little lip up here is actually an eye shade. And because trilobite eyes are these little individual calcite crystals, uh, it helps if you keep light from coming down into them and, and so that the light is more coming from one direction. And so they've actually done work where they figured out how and why these things grew like this. And this is the only species that I know of that has these eye shades. It also tells you the animal was active during the day, or it wouldn't have needed this. It would have been irrelevant. Uh, we go a little further, and we come to a Jurassic 185 million year old ichthyosaur. These are sort of, in a sense, ecologically like a dolphin, but they're reptiles. And, but they're fast swimmers and you know, probably snatching fish, chasing them. They died out 93 million years ago, and we don't actually know why. Uh, and this actually, this animal was put on this slab. And again, you can sort of tell by the way the slab is. But when they don't do that, often there are three or four slabs, and when you join them all together, you kind of end up with a mess. This is one of the most unusual things I saw at the show. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, so these are all trilobites. These are all graptolites. And I had to go look up what graptolites were three or four times because I still didn't understand because there's no real modern analog. And uh, so these were colonial filter feeding animals. They, they cover the whole outside and then Trilobites are in the middle, and there's one other thing, and this thing is three feet high and five feet long. And then I didn't see this other thing there, and I sent an email to the guy selling it, Tom, 
And he said, oh yeah, there's this other thing there. I said, well, tell me about that. So that's this thing. It looks like a comb, but it's not. And, and here, here are all the trilobites, by the way. Uh, so what is the comb? Well, the comb is actually the feeding appendage of this animal, an anomalous carrot. And for about 90 odd years, paleontologists thought there were three animals. One, this little feeding appendage, which they call the shrimp. The mouth, which also preserved well, which looked like pineapple rings, which they call the jellyfish. And then the tail. And it wasn't until 1985 that Harry Whittington, famous paleontologist, was cleaning up one of the Burgess Shale samples and found the whole animal. And then it's sort of like the coin dropped, and they said, wait a minute, these three things are really one animal. And we've been mischaracterizing them for almost a century. And uh, since then, they found a number more of them, and they figured out that and it rich, and they're huge. I mean, this is the biggest animal in the Cambrian and Cambrian Ocean. It's, you know, but they don't really understand, was it an active predator, was it a filter feeder, or different species, different feeding methods. That's, uh, that remains to be determined. What is a mortality plate? Oh, a mortality plate just means a mass of things died all in one spot. Oh. So, you know, all these things either got pushed by a current, um, and then buried very quickly, and so you end up not with just one animal, but with a hundred animals. Is that cave that they've been, or the hole in the ground that all those animals fell into, and they just were they've been excavated really recently? Well, this is this is this was ancient ocean. Well, yeah, but is that is that a mortality plate? It was on the radio yesterday uh, on NPR. I'm not yeah, sure. I, I have to listen to the radio. Those guys were all. Oh, so yeah. they have to all die at once? Or yes. Or the same spot? Okay, right. cool. All at once and all in the same place. And then be found. Uh, so this is a little Bulgarian petrified wood. And uh, in addition, you know, so that's the other language you can hear here. Because uh, there are a lot of dealers from Bulgaria. Who knew Bulgaria had this great mineral wealth? Uh, and you can see behind this, lots of different specimens. So this is just a sense of like you're walking around going in room to room. Uh, so I read geology page, recommended highly. Uh, it's one of these emails that tells you all the, local, the latest geology news. And in November I read about for the first time ever they find trilobite eggs. Well I go to the show and here are these little one inch specimens of trilobites, mostly smaller than that, of trilobites that were hieratized this is where they actually figured out what trilobites really look like. Until then, all they had were these shells, the exoskeleton, like the crab. These preserve antennae, they preserve legs with gills on them, and then some of them also have, are females carrying eggs. And so they never knew that until literally like last year. And then here at the show, they're there for sale. But I, I don't, I'm not crazy about fossils where I need a magnifying glass to actually see anything. Uh, so you can also get to hear Polish. And so this one half of the room is our Polish minerals. And uh, then the other half are Polish ammonites. And, and that's how it goes at the show. It's just everything is very, you know, very, very, every room has something completely different. This gentleman sells only Uruguayan amethyst. And in this room, there's probably 30 or 40 specimens, all similar with big calcite crystals. Uh, this is actually a sample of Uruguayan amethyst, which is it's a quartz that has lots of iron and manganese in it. The Uruguayan stuff is known for its incredibly deep, beautiful purple color. Most beautiful, probably in the world, color-wise. Does that come from an underground mine? Yes. Yeah. And are they mining something else and that's no. not just stuff they No, find? they're mining this. These come out of volcanic deposits for the most part, where there were uh, voids, and then those voids got filled with silica-rich water, which deposited out a silica, and of course, quartz is silica, silicon dioxide, 
but this also had other minerals in it, which gave it purple, sparkly color. And so they could form underground, they could grow slowly, and form these nice, beautiful crystals. But no, they're mining only this. And these things are valuable, so they're, they're happy to do that. Whereas you're right, other minerals, they're mining something else, and they just have to find some fluoride in the pocket and they pull it out. Uh, these are uh, out, of these, we're out of this world meteorites. And uh, I'll pass around a meteorite, not nearly as nice as these. These are known as palisites. So this is an iron nickel matrix with olivine, or the gem quality peridote in it. And uh, when they're backlit, they are absolutely spectacular. So there's a lot of this stuff for us. Yeah. I'm sorry? There's a lot of it fluoresce. You have black lights and how you count. Uh, these don't, yeah. but a lot of the calcites often do. I mean, I have a black light at home. I didn't bring it in. But, and, and so here's a, meteor, a little meteorite, and they're magnetic. They're very iron rich, which is not surprising. Some of them. Right. The converts. So this is an outer space rock. This is the rarest stuff, because it had to come and land on our planet. <laughs> from outer space. Uh, this gentleman, tons of Moroccan minerals, and then on the other side of his room, all Moroccan fossils. He's actually a German guy, so you actually are buying what you think you're buying, uh, unlike some other places. This is a beautiful barite, and uh, we'll see some more of that. Chinese calcite, there's the dog tooth calcite with this sprinkling of calcopyrite on it. And then in the back, he's got a bunch of azurite, which is a uh, copper mineral. And, and an awful lot of Chinese dealers there. Some furniture that uh, uses, it's a, a French company buying Arizona wood, making furniture, and then bringing it back to the United States to sell. So the wood went from Arizona to France, it was cut and polished, and then inset into this table, and then it's back here in the United States for sale. Uh, this is a dining room table with an enormous slab of petrified. So right next to this show, uh, the Tucson City Center, is this whole other building called Fine Minerals, which is one company. They must have 500, 400 minerals in there. Every one of them would be the best mineral in your collection or could go in the Smithsonian. Uh, and so some of that same calcite we saw before, but a really nice specimen. Incredible tourmalines, uh, beautiful Swiss quartz, or that Moroccan barite. Uh, <clears throat> amethyst with a little bit of calcite in it, a, uh, a small one. Here's the big one. I, I'm not even sure geode is the right word. I mean, this thing is probably close to 20 feet long. And just who knows how many tons it weighs. Why, if this particular specimen, are they sorted like they are crystals? Why are they? Sorted or formed like sorting? Uh, that's how they grew. I know it's how they grew. Why did they grow that way? Uh, well, you have, this, you have this boy, this bug, and you get fluid in there, and so they're cutting, you know, you don't know where they're cutting it from. So it could have been the bottom, and all of them are growing up. Well, they're different sizes and different colors. Oh, yeah. Well, the so colors purple, are all pretty, the colors are all fairly similar. But sizes, I mean, it, it would be very unusual for them all to be one size. So that's just typically what happens. It depends on the amount of material there. But, but it's sorted very specifically, smaller, middle, bigger. It's, a, so it's, it's not physically sorted like you would have a table of stuff you sort. No. But it's sorted in the sense that there are layers. Of right, but this is also just how they cut this, too. I mean, this pocket might have had five or six of these cut out of it. I'm not sure I'm answering it's, your question. It's plain if you look at it. It's, 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 it's how it, it's, it's the different. Oh, yeah, it grew from. From yeah, smaller the, to larger, and then. The outside in. 
And then there could have been a difference in the minerals and the water going through to make the colors change a little? It obviously did because the lower ones are white, the bigger ones are purple. I was wondering if there was some. Probably different concentrations. I mean, I have some of these, I have some geodes where you get amethyst, and then you get totally clear quartz, then you get amethyst, then you get something on top of the amethyst. And then, you know, so the, chemistry, the underground chemistry could have taken thousands and thousands of years. And so it can be very complex. Uh, this is the, the, the next show. And again, lots of amethyst. And then in the back, citrine, which is a heat-treated amethyst. Uh, this is Marilyn. And it's standing next to a little oil of quartz, where they had this big quartz pocket. And then they cut it, and they smoothed it. And they made this perfect sphere. Uh, some, some jewelry. Some of these are shells. There's some agate down here. Lots of turquoise, more shells. Uh, again, agate, because there's, there's a lot of it. Turquoise. This is a uvarite, a garnet, a green garnet, a little moss agate. This is that amylite, that iridescent ammonites. These are just trays that are waiting for you to buy and make your own jewelry with. So people come here to buy raw materials to make jewelry, uh, among other things. So a little quartz crystal for your lawn. <laughs> uh, Does that come from a, like a volcanic place too? Uh, this is certainly Brazilian. But I'm not sure what the formation was here. You know, you don't, the amethyst, most of that is from this volcanic stuff. I'm not sure about the quartz uh, So this is this guy brings one or two slices every year. He sells them for like 55 grand each. They're two feet across. I've never seen anything like it. It's, so he had this big stalactite of chrysocolla. They found one or two ever. He somehow got them. And he slices it and polishes it. And every year he brings one and he says, So I'm negotiating on this. I know it's not leaving with me. And it has little malachite eyes in it as well. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. And then underneath is an African malachite. This is for Africa too. Lots of night lights, anywhere from this big to, to that big. And that's all these guys do is sell quartz. Some more woolen ornaments. This is a bench carved out of amethyst, which I, I don't, you know, 500 pounds? I have no idea. You know, you, you certainly wouldn't want to move more than once. And then in the back, you can see rows and rows of more amethyst. So last venue, uh, only 12 dealers, but you're going to see some pretty big stuff. So this is the first room on the right, Geo World, run by an Italian guy, Stefano. And so it's got lots of German stuff, Moroccan stuff, Lebanese stuff, Madagascar. This is that sawfish you saw in the last picture. Uh, there's actual skin on this fossil. That's the level of detail. And uh, it's Cretaceous, about 90, 95 million. You go across the hall, and you're in Brahimin's uh, room, and he's Moroccan. So you've got trilobites that are this big. Then you've got these plates that are 10 feet across with 20 trilobites, or some of them are crinoid plates, or even tables made out of this sort of fossiliferous marble. Uh, this particular thing is from Madagascar, and probably part of from across the hall, where they traded. There's a lot of that. So this is the megalodon mouth. So the megalodons went extinct three million years ago. Uh, the mouth is fabricated, the teeth are totally real. So you could stand in this mouth. I mean, this shark is three plus times the size of a great white. You know, literally great on bus size. It was the top predator in the oceans. This is Tom Lindgren. Uh, his son Adam had the gar and uh, a 
Triceratops. This is a lot of, a little out of focus because I got it off, off the web. This is Tom's room, and it's just a mix of almost everything you can imagine. So here's a Colombian mammoth. These tusks are, are this big around. I mean, this is an absolutely enormous piece. <coughs> you can see part of a fish behind him. This is a uh, Bactinus, which was a terror of the Cretaceous Seaway. This is the Cretaceous Seaway. So this comes out of Kansas, right here, and uh, the, oh, sorry, right, right here. And this is about this one's 15, 16 feet long, and they were not they were not even the top predators. Uh, that was the mosasaurus that we that we met from later. A uh, Green River turtle. This thing is over five feet long. 90% complete. The slab it's on weighs close to 500 pounds. So it's a big piece of rock. And uh, it's a very impressive turtle. And they found two of them together. This is really rare. So this is a half million dollar fossil because they've only found three of them. Maybe two, I'm not sure. Ever. Modern lizards from this age in, in this location. Uh, this is an Ice Age cave bear, and this thing would have given chase to a grizzly rather easily. Uh, these typically come out of Europe, Romania often. A, uh, just another fossil fish, mural with palm leaf. These are not placed, this is how they found it. So there's just hours of preparation here. You go into the next guy's showroom, and it's a mix of amethyst, citrine, and then on the wall, ichthyosaurus. So it's a little bit of everything throughout, or a lot of everything. And here's a, a whole spot of crocodile. Uh, you go across the room, and this is a didymoceros. This is Neil Larson who prepped this double. This is what this animal is. So this is a ammonite, but instead of having a tight coil, it's, it's a loose coil, and it's three-dimensional. And so you can pass this around very carefully. Uh, this is actually, this one's from Madagascar. This one's from South Dakota. But very, very similar animals. And, and no one can actually even explain why there's an advantage to doing this. They couldn't have been fast. So what, what was going on? I did a slideshow uh, a couple of years ago on this German fossil locality called Holzmaden, and I used this picture. So I thought, wow, this is amazing. Well, all of a sudden, I noticed the same fossil here in Tucson, and it's still there. So if you're interested, I can call Martin up and get your price on it. Uh, this thing is probably two feet across. The world's record is a meter the largest crowns ever on these crinoids. And in real life, it would have been upside down. This wood would have been at the top, and these things would have been hanging down. Here's your $100,000 mineral specimen. Uh, this is a uh, mimetite out of Mexico. And it's not particularly big. It's about this big. But just the quality and the rareness, the color, the form, the lack of repair on it. Malachite from China. These uh, stalactites come out of Argentina. And again, very unusual, beautiful stuff. Uh, this is what I talked about where you can get a layer of amethyst, a layer of quartz, another layer of amethyst, and then you get this stalagmite on top of it, and then druzy quartz on top of the whole thing, giving it that sort of sparkly look. Namibia has some of the finest minerals in the world, the most unusual, and so this whole case is nothing but Namibian minerals. Something new at the show, uh, this is a chalcedony, which is a type of quartz, but it's purple, and uh, they just found it this last year, and there's probably 20 people selling it. What part of Indonesia did they find it? I don't know, but if you Google, okay. if you go back and Google uh, purple chalcedony in Indonesia, 
you'll actually get the story of the guy who found it, okay. which I read, but I, I don't remember the details now. Quartz, super common mineral, most common mineral on Earth. But when it grows over fuchsite, very, very unusual and very beautiful. And this specimen's but it's big. Uh, so this is a Devonian, 400 or so million year old uh, fish. The detail in this, so this is, these are related to coelacanths, which are still alive today. It's their cousins that were the first tetrapods to leave the city. But you can see the animal's teeth, and you can actually see the eye. And that is the kind of preservation that you know, this, this should be in the museum. More uh, Moroccan barite, a very rare copper mineral, a copper uh, silicate from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Again, this beautiful color and form, that's what makes this like a $27,000 specimen. More rare minerals, uh, Vivianite, with this other phosphate mineral, uh, blood of mine. This would have been the terror of the Devonian seas, uh, Douglas and armored fish. And so these teeth are not really teeth, they're actually part of the jawbone. And so my thinking is they hadn't really refined the whole tooth thing yet. So if this guy had lost the tooth, it couldn't regrow. It, it's like having your arm broken. It was actually part of the jawbone. These are 14 feet long, and uh, this one came out of Morocco. This is quartz, again, really common, but when it's got this aluminum copper silicate adjuvant in there, it becomes very rare, very unusual, and it's hard to ever see it. So, almost done. Uh, this is one of the strangest and least understood animals to ever find its way into a Tucson hotel room. <laughs> or an ocean, it's a plesiosaur, and the head is two feet long, the neck has 70 vertebrae, and so this is in a hotel room, it's got all these different skeletons, it's a little room, and this is what the animal would have looked like, and we still can't quite understand how something could propel itself forward with the rudder in front of it, I mean, typically you put a rudder behind, and then you can control which direction you're going. But somehow, this animal lived for many, many millions of years and uh, was, was quite successful until the end of Cretaceous time. So that's it till next February. And this kind of sums it up. More dealers, both directions. So <laughs> You replace the springs in your car if you're coming back? I forgot. And I, uh, I either put it in my luggage or I have a friend who owns a quarry in Kimmerer who lives in Thane. And he hopefully sells what he brings down so he has room in his trailer for when I want to bring it back. <laughs> and so I just get it. I just drive to Thane and get it. And then, yes, it still damages the springs in my car. I can see what I had. This show down on what would be the old Wild West. But, you know, when you think of like, like conflict diamonds and stuff like that, are, is there some kind of vetting on all this stuff that's coming in from all the world? Is all this stuff legal and acquired legally? That's okay. So that's a really good question. Um, you know, and, and, and I would say, you know, it is certainly buyer beware. There is clearly material there that is not legal, okay? In other words, that's that's been manufactured, and you have, to, you have to understand it to know which is which. All these things have been somewhat, you know, affected by people. So this, you know, if you found, if you saw this rock lying on the ground, you'd think you wouldn't even pick it up. You saw it in half and polish it, this is what you get. This is an agate, and, and I'll pass this around also. So everything's been manipulated to some degree or another. And it's just sort of the degree of manipulation. Uh, but clearly, you don't want stuff that's totally fake. As far as real, as far as legal and, and non-legal, uh, 
you know, what I will say is the United States has people down there undercover at the show. I know one of them. Uh, she's a friend of mine. And they're looking for stuff that has either been taken from public land in the United States illegally or uh, perhaps was imported with the wrong paperwork. So there certainly is some of that. And so my thinking is you want to buy from people you know and people you trust. And, you know, and that, that's the best answer. But there absolutely is that kind of stuff going on. What's the biggest rock you bought? Oh, are we talking? Uh, size, physical size. Well, I. Barber's ring. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, I, I bought a, uh, a round of petrified wood this big that I turned into a table. I mean, I guess that would, that would be up there. And then I have an amethyst slab that's about this big, covered with crystals. But, you know, sometimes the smallest things like this are some of the coolest. And so this is actually at Indiana. And, you know, the three dimensionality of it and the detail in it. Uh, so big is not always better. No, the big is not always. The crinoid is the biggest out of that. Oh yeah. So I'm sorry, Doug. Yes, I, they reminded me that I have a crinoid that's six feet long and about three feet wide and weighs 200 pounds. That's hanging on the wall in the studs. How do you, how do you normally display your rocks? Uh, well. They're, they're sort of all over my house. I mean, I've, I've, I've built some display cabinets and... You buy know, a ticket to the right. uh, Lake Shore Museum. Right. I mean, some of them, like, like this, so you saw some dinosaurs. Well, this is what comes out of the back end. Uh, this is a coprolite dinosaur poo that my friend Dave Anderson gave me. Because Dave goes to Tucson, buys raw rock. I mean, this is what it looks like. But then you saw it in half and polish it, it's been agatized, and it's gorgeous. And it doesn't even smell. So that's the biggest, the six by three. And that has that German crying noise. That, uh, it's, a, it's a smaller version of that, much cheaper. My uncle had a lot of rocks in here in his library. He and where had are they? lights yeah. on, on all his shelves. Okay. And he looks up at fluorescents. Yeah, I, I have a fluorescent collection too. I actually keep it in a pan of late scale. I have a I use the lid near you know, the fluorescent mineral capital of the world. So I, uh, I got to go to Franklin, New Jersey. And dig through the tailings pile and find my own fluorescent rocks. Well, that's where you live, you live here. And I found some fluorescent rocks here as well. Mm -hmm. Do you use a special black light for that? Is it just um, you want a short wave, short wave black light. Okay. Because most oh, minerals, okay. wow. some only do long wave yeah. fluorescence, but the majority fluoresce under short wave. Okay. And I have, I have a very good one if you want to you know, borrow and use it. They're, they're not inexpensive. And, and this is that the fluorescent thing is a whole other category of mineral collectors. Body? Oh, has the geology group ever taken a trip down to Cameron with children or grandchildren on a weekend? It's taken, it, well, as you know, the average age of the members of the geologists of Jackson Hole uh, <laughs> is older. It is older. So we have gone down to Kemmerer and we've dug in uh, Wally Ulrich's quarry. Mm -hmm. There were no children along unless I count as one. I think it'd be great. When I'm with them. rocks, I am. So mm -hmm. I think it'd be great to take my well, a lot of grandchildren here and because I don't know a lot about it, I'd love to go with the group. I think it'd be a blast. Yeah, well they the quarries actually have public so you can go to Wally Ulrich's quarry or Rick Hebden's and you can pay whatever it is, I don't know. And you can go dig for a day, and they'll show you how to do it. They'll explain what you're finding, and you will come home with fish. And so I can give you those names of those people that you can, you don't have to wait for us to organize it. You you can go do it anyway. I know, but it's just the social. I mean, I love the group and the oh, National Park is right. facility down there is very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've actually had the. Uh, 
the head of the museum down there, the chief paleontologist, has kind of spoken to us twice. So we're, we're well aware of it. We, we like going there. I, I'm just fascinated and amazed by the logistics of all this. The shipping companies make millions on this, you know. And, 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 and what's the currency down there? I mean, you've got the countries from all over the world. Dollars. Is it dollars, yeah. not yeah. bitcoins or something? No. Dollars. Okay. Dollars. And cash is definitely better. Sure. Uh, and, and so, yeah, a lot of people, what they do is, if they're not from the U.S., so if you say you're shipping material over from England or, or Morocco, you'll rent a storage unit for what you don't sell, and you'll just put it there until the next year. And you'll split it with two or three people. And, you know, so you'll pay 40 bucks a month or whatever. But you split that because you're only doing half of it. So now you got 20 bucks a month into this thing. You know, you got 200 bucks, and then you come back next year and you still have this stuff. Yes. Paper so a lot of people do things like that. But yeah, the logistics are amazing. People are always pulling their hair out because it's still on the water. It didn't clear customs. Customs broke this, customs broke that. Mm -hmm. and, and when I say I've showed you one one thousandth of this, it might be one one hundredth. I mean, the problem was not to put in this. The problem was, I have a thousand pictures for Tucson. And you know, choosing like a hundred of them was really, really a challenge. And even that, I felt like it might be overkill for people to sleep. Everybody did very well. Nancy? Well, the logistics was something I was thinking about too. But also, um, if people are spending that amount of money to get things here and to be displaying, and you know, year after year after year, there must be, uh, and then they're selling, um, or else they wouldn't be there. Um, how is it supply? I mean, well, when you go to Tucson, you're buying. Generally, you can buy so there's no middleman. So, right, but but I was thinking more. Where's all this coming from? I mean, oh, it's coming is from. Is it inexhaustible? No, but I mean, but. Well, Kemmerer, as an example, yeah. there's there's many, many years worth of fossils on the ground. They have, I mean, okay. it's primarily coming out of this 18-inch layer. That's where the best fossils are coming out of. But that covered a lake that was the size of a Wyoming county. That's a lot of territory. I mean, that's a lot of right. square feet. And, and then they're also finding there are other layers that they didn't look at before that actually have really good stuff in there too. So they're, they're continuing to find more. But yeah, I mean, you see things there like that fish. Wrong way. I mean, some of these things, like this piece, is a one of kind. Right. You know, you're not going to yeah. find. You might find another one that has graptolites, but you're not going to find it with the with the trilobites, with the animal, animal carrot. You're not going to find another uh, <coughs> There's three of these ever. Ever. So you know, are these gonna are they gonna find another one? Maybe, maybe not. They don't know until they, you know, until they find another one. When they do, all of a sudden the price of this one goes down. But, right. That's what I was thinking too. Right. right. But but yeah, it's absolutely, you know, a, a finite resource in some ways. I would imagine that uh, universities and museums oh, send, send their buyers there. Absolutely. Time. No, I, yeah, no, I mean, some of these things, I mean, a private collector could buy this, absolutely, and they do. Uh, I mean, there's Japanese private collectors that come and you know, they buy a container worth of stuff. But certainly there's stuff like a 30-foot-long Mosasaur. They're looking for a museum to come buy that. I mean, most, you know, you're going to put that edition on your house so you can put it in there, but most people couldn't do that. No. <laughs> My property line is probably way no out. <laughs> you just have to give visiting rights. Yeah. So let's say somebody's just, you know, like you in love with fossils. How do they 
manage to be the person who then acquires these things and shows them? Did they inherit the land? Did they buy the land? Are they just, how does most of it work in terms of who gets their hands on these to be the even sell? So in Kemmerer, basically, you either own the land. So Rick Hebden, my the guy down in Thane, he, uh, his father had a ranch down there. And they didn't know. They were just running sheep. And all of a sudden, they found these fossils. And they said, this is a lot more fun than chasing sheep. And you know, so their business is poor. Other people, uh, they lease land from somebody. You know, so there's, there's somebody who owns it, but they don't want to dig it, because they do want to run sheep. And they don't know anything about rocks. So this guy comes along and says, well, I already have a quarry in Solnhofen in Germany. And well, it's modern in Germany. I need, a, I need a quarry here in Wyoming because this is what I do with fossils. And I have warehouses in Asia, North America, and Europe filled with fossils. And I, that's what I do is I go around and I do these shows all year. And so that's what... Uh, and they slam and hire people to prepare the specimens or whatever. They prep them themselves. They have people that work for them. You know, go. I mean, it depends on the delicacy of it. I mean... You know, Rick couldn't prep every single thing he finds, but if he finds one of these, he's going to prep it himself. He's not going to trust anybody to do it. And so, like, we had a speaker here, uh, Forrest, from uh, BYU, and he found a starfish. And he knows how to prep fossils. They have a whole lab that do it right there in, in, in Rexburg all the time. He sent this one back to Indiana to a guy who he knows is like the best in the country. I just wondered, because there seem to be an awful lot of people who are able to be there. That's a lot of people for an industry like this. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, and there's an awful lot of people you don't see. Right. I mean, like you don't see the people in Morocco who were there digging holes in the ground looking for these things and then prepping them or casting them or whatever they're doing. So yeah, it, it, it's a bigger industry than one would think. So you go to Tucson and you get an idea of how, how big it is. But again, this is this is the show that gets buyers and sellers from the whole planet in, in one city for, for two weeks. So how far ahead do you have to book uh, rooms? You know, I well I've been staying with a friend, uh, so but I but one year, yeah. But yeah, but one year my friend canceled on me because she had a little fight with a boyfriend. And uh, I found the room within like two days, but I was pretty lucky. And I thought I'd be sleeping in the car. But, but Tucson has this, I mean, one of the reasons they choose Tucson is it's a big, spread out Western city. You know, the traffic's not so crazy. You know, yes, it is. What <laughs> <laughs> compared to LA, it's not. <laughs> or Phoenix. Yeah, compared and to the actual Phoenix. Phoenix. <laughs> That's right. Phoenix. And they have all these big empty uh, lots where they can throw up these tents. I mean, I showed you five of 44 venues. And so some of these things are just are huge. And, uh, is there camping down there? You know, I have yeah. never camped, but I'm sure you yes. could. You just have to leave the city limits. And, yeah. 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 How many days are you I was there a week, which is about the most. I mean, unfortunately, it's during prime ski season. So it's, it's a bit of a... Camper camp. I, I have to balance how much powder I want in this. Do you ever do any digging yourself? Well, I find rocks and fossils all the time. Okay. I mean, not in the winter months, but... Yeah. And, and mostly I don't dig, mostly I look on the surface. But yeah, I mean, I found, I found beautiful cryonoids that, if prepped, would look almost like this. I mean, they're still there because they're in a rock that's this big. Yeah. You know. so. But yeah, I mean, I could, I could take anybody out and find. Like, in fact, we were just out, where were we? I don't know, I found fossils the last time we were out walking. Yeah, on Blacktail Butte, I found fossils. On Snow King, I found fossils. They're everywhere. You just have to learn to see them. That's all. And then they're not you can't prepped out. Them everywhere. Right. No, you Blacktail can't. Butte. You absolutely cannot take them, nor should you take them from everywhere. Uh, and if they're vertebrates, you're not allowed to take them from anywhere, unless you own the land. But, but these are all invertebrates.
You want to come for look for some fossils on my land? <laughs> sure. Green you, River. You get a cut, right? Seven hundred <laughs> acres, and there might be things on it. Right? Well. <laughs> I'd like to know. I'd like to find out. Hey, your field yeah. trip. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Bring the children. Everybody, everybody with a shovel, show up. 700 acres will keep you busy for a while. <laughs> or be busy for a while. Have shovel, a little travel. Yeah. There must have been a ton of security down there, too. Oh, yeah, there is. I mean, a, for the most part, the mineral and fossil people are pretty well behaved. I mean, the drinking usually doesn't start until in the evening. <laughs> and there's nobody younger than 70, so... Oh, no, no, there's lots be... of... There's, there's hippies there, you know, modern-day hippies. I mean, they're not hippies like when I was young, but there are people that are, you know, 20-something years old walking around barefoot selling, you know, crystals oh, you. and making little jewelry out of stuff they buy or trying to sell some stuff they found, you know, back in the hills. So... It's, it's all ages, it really. It's all ages, it's all countries, it's... Uh, Mike, who are the wholesale uh, venues for aimed at? Uh, the wholesale venues are aimed at people like my nature gallery or other stores where they have a resale license, which I have. Uh, but, and, and so then they can buy and sell and go through all the tax documentation. So that last venue, like where this is, every dealer in there is theoretically only supposed to sell wholesale. Now, Ramin, the Moroccan guy, I have a feeling he doesn't really care because he doesn't pay taxes in the United States, probably. Or if he does, it's, it's fairly straightforward for him. That's the difference, though. I mean, you still have to pay tax even in the retail function. Well, well, the, well, you don't have to pay the sales tax because it gets passed through to the, the next stage. I mean, point of fact, in Tucson, they, for the most part, look the other way. And so there's no sales tax collected on almost any of this stuff. And most people don't even ask for documentation. Some do, and then it helps to have a resale number. But most just don't even care. You know, a lot of it is, some of it is very organized, and some of it's less organized and more sort of homegrown. Like the guy doing all this agatized coral, he's retired. He's from Maine. His name's John. Every summer, every winter, rather, he goes down to Florida, goes and digs all these fossil coral heads up. He trucks them back up to Maine. And then in the summer, he cuts them all up and polishes them. Then he brings them over. And yeah, it's a business, but you know, how much of it does he report? And, uh, I have no idea, and I'm not going to ask him. How about certificates of authenticity and that kind of stuff? Oh, I would, I would ask for those, for sure, depending on, you know, what you're buying. I mean, sometimes you can just tell, you know, like you see something like this, it can only be petrified for it. But when you're buying uh, crinoids or, or trilobites, yeah, you, you should ask for that. And most people should be able to provide that. And again, like something like this, I'm buying this from the guy who owns the quarry, who dug the rock, who prepped it himself. So, you know, I have this whole chain, and I, and I bought 10 of these things from him. So, you know, I, I have a whole history there, uh, you know, and, and, and the other thing is you can learn to recognize. So like you can put a black light on a, on a trilobite, for example, and you can see glue lines and places where things were fabricated. So there's ways, once you understand this a little better, to sort of protect yourself or to know what you're buying and, and, and know that you're getting what you think you're getting. But some things like these megalodon teeth, it's really hard. You can't fake them. Same with the corals, you can't, you can't fake them. <coughs> you take his ATM card away before he goes? He goes on a budget. I bring cash. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I would imagine ATMs are busy down there. They are very busy down there. Any other questions? It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank yes. you.